Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and this is Chemistry Essentials video 54 which is on intermolecular potential energy. This is a famous macromolecule right here, it's DNA, and every bond that you see is a covalent bond where you're sharing electrons between atoms. But it's a double helix and what that really means is it's a double molecule. There are two molecules and in the middle they're held together with intermolecular forces. Those are going to be hydrogen bonds or dipole-dipole forces which are going to hold those two chains together. And so really it's easy easy to pull DNA apart and for it to zip right back together again. And so we really want to make sure you understand the difference between an intermolecular and intramolecular. An intermolecular is going to be between adjacent molecules, between the yellow and the yellow. And so that would be, for example, between water and another water molecule. What are the intramolecular? Those are going to be the bonds. Those are going to be those covalent or ionic bonds that are actually between the atoms within the molecule itself. And so we're not dealing with bonds in this video. We're dealing with those forces between molecules. And those forces are based on what those molecules are. We can have an attraction between a dipole and a dipole. We can have an attraction between a dipole and an induced dipole, and then also between induced dipoles. And between each of these, there's going to be potential energy in those intermolecular forces, and it's going to take energy to pull those apart. And so an example of a dipole-dipole would be a hydrogen bond. And so what we're doing there is we're taking hydrogen atoms of one molecule, and they're being attracted to oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine atoms of another molecule. And those are both dipoles, and so what we're getting is an attraction between those two. Those aren't of the same molecule, they're just holding those two molecules together. If we look at between two induced dipoles, that could be, for example, between argon, which normally doesn't have a charge, but can get a charge if we hold something like hydrochloric acid right next to it. And then finally, we could have two induced dipoles. An uh, example of the forces between those are going to be dispersion forces. What are induced dipoles? They're everything. So there's a force between everything and those are called dispersion forces and they're based or the strength of them is based on the number of electrons that you have, the more electrons, the more dispersion forces we can have, and also the surface area and contact between those two molecules. So again in review, what is a dipole? It's simply a molecule that has uneven distribution of electrons. And so if we look at water as an example, the oxygen Oxygen loves those electrons, it's highly electronegative, so it's pulling it towards it, and so there's going to be a slightly negative charge on this side and a positive charge on the other side of the water molecule. It's a dipole. If we look at hydrochloric acid, the same thing here. The electrons are going to be pulled toward the chlorine atom, and so it's going to have a negative charge right here and a positive charge on the other side. Now these two negatives are going to push on each other, and so what would a dipole-dipole bond look like? It's going to be looking like this, or rather a force is going to look like that, and it's going to hold those two molecules together, but again, it's not a bond between the two. Hydrogen bond is a great example of a dipole-dipole force. If we were to take water molecules like this, you can see that all of their oxygens are going to have negative charges, and so that's not how it's going to line up. In a hydrogen bond, the way it would line up would be like this, and so we now have an attraction between this hydrogen and this oxygen. This would be a hydrogen bond right here, there'd be another hydrogen bond right here, another hydrogen bond right here, another hydrogen bond right here. Now, a point of confusion, remember, is that it's not in the same molecule. It's going to be between a hydrogen of one molecule and then either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine of another molecule. Now this is a huge amount of energy that's held in this. And let me give you an example of that. What we're looking at now is the boiling point of four different molecules. And so we'll start right here with hydrogen telluride. That's H2. Uh, TE. And if we look at its molecular mass, it's over here, and then its temperature of boiling point is going to be a little less than zero degrees. And so if I go to the next one up in that group, we've got hydrogen selenide. And so we can see here that we have a decrease in the molecular mass and we also have a decrease in the boiling point. If we go to the next one, hydrogen sulfide, you can see that there's a really well-established pattern right here. As we move to smaller atoms, we're getting less molecular mass and we're also getting a lower boiling point. So what's going to be the next one if we go through this pattern? It's going to be H2O, so that's going to be water. Could you predict where that's going to be? Well, you might think it's going to be something like this, but it actually is way up here. Why is that? Because there's all these hydrogen bonds between the water molecules, and so it really takes a lot of energy to break those apart and to boil that water. Thankfully, that's why we're filled with water, so our temperature doesn't change that much. 
So what's a dipole induced dipole force? Well, if we have hydrochloric acid and argon mixed together, what we'll find is that this argon doesn't have a charge. But if we pull it close to a dipole, what it'll do is it'll actually pull those electrons towards it. And so what you get is an induced dipole. And so this is a force that's holding them together. Since there are more electrons on this side, it has a partial negative charge right here. Now, how are we going to measure the strength of that bond? It's based on two things. It's based on the strength of that dipole, and it's also based on the polarizability, in other words, the number of electrons and how those electrons can be pulled of that induced dipole. And sometimes we'll have molecules that can both form induced dipoles. So right here we have helium gas. As it moves close to another helium atom, you can see that there's an attraction between the electron and the protons of the adjacent atom. And there's also going to be a repulsion between these electrons. And so what we're creating is a temporary dipole for just a fraction in time, but it's still going to hold those things together. And so all molecules have these induced dipole to induced dipole forces. All molecules have this attraction between them. What's going to increase that attraction, it's simply going to be the number of electrons that we have and the surface area. And so this is a picture of a gecko that's climbing up glass. And if you look at their foot, we're going to find that there are folds. And then if you zoom in on those folds, there's folds on the folds on the folds. And so how are they magically able to walk up a wall like this? It's those attractions, those dispersion forces between them and the wall. And so they've increased the uh, surface area, increased the number of electrons, and so we can have enough of an attraction to actually hold them up. And so did you learn to make claims or predictions regarding these intermolecular forces? Again, it's based on what's holding them together. Is it dipole-dipole, dipole-induced dipole, or just induced dipoles? These are all intermolecular forces, and I hope that was helpful.